What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And today we have Coach Matt Aldred, who is the Director of Strength and Conditioning for Michigan Basketball. We're going to be talking all things fascia. We're going to talk basketball training. It's going to be a great ride. Enjoy it. Buckle up. Matt, let's first of all start off with thank you for being here. I mean, you've got a lot going on your plate. You just moved to a brand new location. So thank you for being here, educating uh, myself, educating our listeners. So again, first of all, thank you very much for making the time. Of course. Thanks for having me on. Um, First question that somebody had was like, what defines fascia training? Like what is like, okay, if there's, you know, if you're stretching, like isn't technically everything fascia training, if you're putting, if you're moving the muscles and moving the stimulus, like, let me read, I'm starting to bastardize what they were saying. What'd they say here? Um, Like technically all training is fascia training. Is it not? If you view training through the lens of fascial lines, would sport movements in and of themselves be considered fascia training? How do you differentiate um, from some of the go to functional patterns, 3d maps, like what is and what isn't fascia? Great question. Um, I think Brijesh Patel does a great job of saying like, you can't necessarily be like, Hey, today's a fascial day. Like we're going to train the fascia today. Like it doesn't, it is the fascia is connected tissue system. Like everything works together. Um, but like you think about energy systems, right? The, you know, anaerobic aerobic, like they all work together, but you can train specifically to focus on certain things, but you will still tap into ATP PC anaerobic glycolysis aerobic oxidation like you're going to tap into those energy systems whether you're 800 meters you're going to run everything what are you primarily focusing on you know a mile like a hundred meter sprint a marathon like you're going to have to use all these energy systems but a marathon might be you know 95 percent aerobic but five percent anaerobic for the sprints at the start or maintaining a four minute pace whatever it is they're doing these days so the same thing applies kind of fascia training um you know i i look at it as being um you know you've obviously got traditional weightlifting you've got where we're trying to break down the tissue, the muscle tissue, we're trying to uh, have hypertrophy, you're trying to put on lean mass. So let's just go like barbell bench, squat, deadlift, bicep curl, like think the mechanical, regular mechanical strength training we're talking about. But then you also have the fascial based training, which is going to work the fascial system, in our opinion, more than it is going to be the bicep, the hamstring, everything's going to be more interconnected with the fascial based stuff. So say a back squat, like you're primarily working, obviously, you know, the quads, your back, hamstrings, glutes, but you know, fascial based training adds a, a unstable aspect to it. So there has to be that proprioception and coordination adds a speed aspect to it, adds offset loading to it and it adds intrinsic stability. So imagine doing an RDL with a landmine and then I'm coming up and pressing it overhead. Yeah, I'm going to be working my hamstring muscle, but I'm also working my full body in that movement with speed, with coordination, with a change in direction. So working different vectors, different um, different planes of motion. So instead of just the typical RDL, which is going to work the hamstrings, it's also going to work the fascia. Your fascia, your collagen is going to lay down in the areas where it's stressed, right? It's, it's Davis's law. So it's going to be, yeah, you're working the fascia, you're doing RDL, but how can we maximize that training, which is more replicable to sport, is doing movements such as like landmine side lunge with speed, landmine RDL or bed press, Dumbo impulse lunge. I love the simple example would be a cable chest press. Okay. If I'm doing it, I'm, I've got a cable here. I'm stepping out split stance and I'm doing a chest press with rotation. So I'm in a split stance position. My body is rotating. Yeah. I'm going to be working my pec and anterior deltoid and you know, my triceps, but I'm working my whole body. The whole body has to be engaged in this exercise. Whole body has to have intrinsic stability and I can add speed to this. I can add accommodating resistance. I can increase the load on the way back with the Kaiser machine. I can add all sorts of variation. I can do band work with that. That to me is more fascial based programming and training because you're going to work the more speed aspect of it. And I'm not really thinking as you're doing a cable chest press, well, that's type two fibers, you're working fast twitch. It's like, no, it's probably more the connective tissue system as a whole working together. What if somebody was like, okay, but what if it's mainly just hypertrophy for the muscles, not so much fascia training. What would like, and I'm trust, I'm just asking mm-hmm. questions mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah. I'm not trying to poke holes in sure. anything. So if someone wanted to just work functional hypertrophy. Yeah. If somebody's like, Hey, okay. But like, no, I'm not training. Hy- if somebody was like going to be contrarian and they're like, no, Matt, all I'm doing is I'm just doing horizontal press and I'm doing it in a split stance to challenge my torso. And I'm turning on subsystems of, uh, you know, opposite groin going up mm-hmm. through the torso, like that diagonal sling is, is, is that still training 
the fascist system or is it training the sling? Is the sling the fascial system, like talking, tying it into any Thomas Myers anatomy train stuff? Yeah, I, my, my debate would that be, okay, so say that is a regular functional hypertrophy exercise. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to add in the time, time to tempo, right? Time on attention if it's going to be hypertrophy. So probably a four second tempo. Well, that's a big 40, 45 second set. There's going to be a lot of load going through that body for you to have to maintain that position for so long. So now I'd argue, well, you might be getting into an isometric almost for the knee. Mm. If you're in that front lunge position for so long, so you're going to work the tendon in that sense. And also like, that's a lot of force through the body. Now, if you go, right, well, I want to make it max strength. I want to go all the way up. I want to go Kai's. I want to go like 70 and try and grind out three reps. First off, I probably wouldn't recommend that. Might be unsafe for the shoulder. But like you're having to produce so much force and so much internal stability through your core to hold that position. Like you can't tell me that's just functional hypertrophy. That's going to have way more transfer to sport, working all the systems in the body. I mean, you're having like lock in everything there. You're having to lock in your brain for the exercise. You're having to be dialed in like a one RM. You're having to really have your feet through the floor, floor like big toe to pink uh, middle finger. Like everything's got to be engaged if you're doing a heavy rep there, or even the time under tempo. Like you're going to have to really think about it. That's going to work the full body. You don't often think about functional hypertrophy as like I'm training my full body. You'll go, no, I'm doing functional hypertrophy today for my chest. And my back and then I'm, I'm on my b series i'm going to do functional hypertrophy for my biceps and my triceps so this this is more of a change in perspective is yeah okay if i have an athlete that needs functional hypertrophy sure i'll do 88666 i'll do 61225 i'll do some high wave loading i'll do uh heavy light method i'll do all that stuff that's fine i'll do eight sets of six i'll do i used to i'll do eight sets of three jake two, all right, i'll do all that that's fine um, but then the B series, well, how can we make it more athletic? Like, yeah, we need to put 15 pounds on this guy. I had an athlete today who's played in the NBA. He does not need to put on a lick of muscle. Keeping your certification is essential to staying hired as a strength and conditioning coach. Both of our long form courses, Fundamentals 1 and Fundamentals 2, offer CEUs to the NSCA, the NCSF, as well as the ASCA professional development points. Click the link down below to learn more about our education courses, which are both over 20 hours long and allow you to learn from some of the best practitioners in the field of strength and conditioning. But what should I, as a point guard, what does he need to work on? Probably maintaining his max strength, relative strength, and his speed. And footwork, whatever you could say. Like, I'm probably going to go more down the cable press for speed, dumbbell row for speed, especially because these some hoopers, you know, they want to get a quick workout and before the before they go on the court. Great. Let's get a 20 minute sweat. Great. Contract, relax, dumbbell, kettlebell swing, maybe pogo jumps. Awesome. Some soleus work. Great. Let's go on the court. Just tick that off. We've worked and then we've worked the chest. We've worked to primary press and we've worked to primary pull with the anchor row and the Kaiser chest press. Um, but, you know, I guess to answer that question, it's been an evolution for me probably the last year and a half, especially at Furman when I was had athletes, had some athletes for five years. And I, I took Danny's course, Fascia Chronicles, and I was like, this is really good because I do think the older an athlete is, the more variability they need. I think the more change in stimulus they need because they should be strong enough. Now, if you ask me what strong enough is, I don't know. <laughs> if they can trap bar deadlift three, 375, 415, I, I feel 405, I feel like they're good. Think, but four plates on a trap bar, like I'm, I'm good with that. You know, I had the guy do it the other day, great. Like I, I'm not going to go, let's go 415, 420, 425. Like, no. Like I'm going to look at working other capacities now. Let's maintain that. Let's keep that. It's really good, but let's work other capacities. That's kind of where my this thought process came from, and changing up the stimulus for them. Because you know, hearing hearing you say that, and then even thinking back to like training athletes, you know, it doesn't matter really what the sport is because just the evolution of our field. It doesn't necessarily always matter like how much they can deadlift and be, like because they're not laying down, especially in basketball. Like doing those. I'm going to call it weird movements, right? Like just in an unusual situation, like that is the strength that athletes need to learn and be able to display. Yeah. I, if you watch 10 minutes of practice, the, the angles and the shapes these guys get in is crazy. And I'm not even saying like, let's just think about when they die for a loose ball or when someone gets a, a tip rebound and like, you're having a really re I mean, these guys are like the body position is crazy. So why would I then go in the weight room and just limit them to like, bilateral sagittal hey when you do a forward lunge make sure your toes are here make sure you're here 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 like i want to be a bit more expressive with it like i want them to have a big movement literacy so if we do a forward lunge i said i don't really care where your feet is if your foot comes in hey kd's feet come in when he shoots he's he's hall of famer like you're okay with that i don't mind that if you've got really big hip in in you know internal rotation and you can't literally open up your hips to do a lateral shuffle that's an issue but like a side lunge just say a reactive side lunge i say hey be a player 
do you got five reps each leg? It'd probably be more like four or three. Lightweight, take a quick step, stand back. Don't make it three o'clock every time, please. Make it short, make it wide, have your toes come in out. Be a player. Think about you're on the court, you're trying to get, trying to create space. Be a player. And it's the same with a forward lunge. Like if your toes are going to come in when you're doing a forward step back lunge, they're not going to be in a straight line because your body doesn't have that, pole. It doesn't, it's not the right angle. It's not what you do on the court. So whatever you want to do, just don't go heavy with the weight because then you slow it way down and it becomes a nothing exercise. Be light, fives, tens, fifteens, press into the floor, push back, press, push back, progression, we press and go to an overhead press. You know, like I like that variability because again, we, you know, we do trap bar deadlift. We did it yesterday. Great. I love it. I think it's a great big stimulus for these guys, nervous system. I think it's important, especially with a new team. Like I do think we need to have one solid, like I love Hatfield riff elevated, but trap bar deadlift. Yeah. That's going to stay in my program. I haven't back squatted guys in probably three years and I haven't felt a let off. I've just done a lot of single leg training, riff elevated lunge. Just think it's more applicable to this game, to my athletes. And hearing you say that, it's almost like you have to you have to give them that heavy stimulus to elicit the adaptation for their tendon health, right? To make sure that they're lifting that heavy weight and their, like you said, their expression of maximal strength for uh, growth hormone release, testosterone sure. release. So you got to keep those in there. But it almost sounds like, hey, <clears throat> all right, maybe your A block is that big stimulus, that heavy thing, and then now your accessories almost to you know, piggyback or steal off of the uh, West side barbell crew, but they would be like, all right, we're going to do um, some version of a squat. And then maybe they do a, their B block would be a exercise that helps with the squat, but then the C block and everything else was like abs. And it was essentially bodybuilding hypertrophy training. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. it's like, all right, we're going to do a heavy de uh, deadlift. And then we're going to go into our accessory movements, which are going to be fascia driven, or they're going to be in these, unusual movements where it's requiring more and more proprioception cross body sling style for sure 100 percent. like the max strength needs to stay there so like power strength times speed we need the strength i get that you know we do need that in the a series a series move might be like more of a power complex three exercises pogo jumps some dc block fast feet work and then maybe that step back lunge right getting them prime three four sets of that then i'd go into my trap bar so technically, yeah, the C series, like if I've done trap bar deadlift and like, let's say a Kaiser hold, so I don't want to overload the lower back, just do a Kaiser hold for the B2. The C series, like, yeah, I guess I could do a dumbbell lateral raise. I guess I could do a telly raise. I could do a Zotman curl, but like, can we get a bit more expressive with other qualities for certain athletes? Some athletes do need that. Some athletes need it like freshmen that are skinny. Yes. Bodybuilding methods, no issue at all. You need to gain that mass because you need the strength before we can get to the speed. Or if you're super wiry, I mean, I'm trying to think like Wemby. You think Wemby, Wemby, you think he's putting on muscle mass? I think he's probably good where he's at. Maybe he's put on five pounds, 10 pounds. If he puts on 30 pounds, he slows down. He's not the athlete he is. Mm. Not one bit. Chet Holmgreen with OKC, um, those guys are super smart. They just got like strength and conditioning coach of the year. Like you think they're not hearing other people say you need to put weight on this guy. Guess what? I think they, they've kept him healthy and they figured out what works for him. You know, but so often as strength coaches, we're like before and after picks, gotta look good and i'm like i get that i do get that but like what does the athlete need what's their superpower what's their weakness raise the ceiling raise the basement talk to them do you want to do like the optional sessions do you want to do some curls yeah like everyone will do that stuff like that's part of it but yeah the, the it's just been an evolution of me like when i write sit down and program it's okay can i do more than just a dumbbell front raise a dumbbell lateral raise can i do more I might give, um, can I do more than an ab rollout? Can I do the Kaiser? Can I do any type of different core exercise that I think is really going to challenge them? Because especially for older athletes, they've done those exercises a thousand times already. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Team Builder. Team Builder has been my online software platform choice since 2019. Been using it at Towson, using it at Goldfinch, and use it with my online remote clients. You can learn more about them in the link down below. Team Builder is also part orno in the plyo mat, which will allow you to get quick, valid, and reliable jump data, jump height, ground contact time, and reactive strength index in just seconds. They are part owner of Plyomat, so you can check them out in the link down below as well. Before I get to my next question, can we please, can I, I'd like to just talk about the before and after pictures. I don't know what you've done, but I really hope you don't do what I know other coaches do where their athletes come in day one and they don't flex, they don't pump. And then when they do their after session, they literally do a full pump and then they're like all right go ahead okay. it's like look okay. at the difference like bro okay. i literally have seen it happen in person 
it's you know it's funny though because that just shows like that's that's the sad part about our industry is you know we're always looking for ways to quantify how good we are right or like not how good we are but like you know i'm i'm good for this role like i'm valuable like pay me like i want to do this right we're always looking for those ways and, and before and after pictures you don't need to be an expert in any anatomy to go you know what like oh he's good at his job that guy like look at those body changes so like we 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 just go like full i don't play poker but we're like all in the the the, the, the chips are in on that because that can be one thing where you know you can have pictures of that in a facility right you can have pictures of before and after pictures I, yeah that's the guy i train here this 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 it's like because it's an easy way but wow now what should really happen is like hopefully the return would be you know what he was dialed into his diet our performance dietitian was spot on awesome his mindset was unbelievable he turned up every day worked his butt off like credit to him i'm just showing you to be like that's what you can do if you come here you know what i'm mm. saying but like that's that's the beauty in it but like yeah it's funny we did it one time at firm and, and me and coach bernardi and, and i was like i saw someone do it i was like let's use the professional photographer so we get the white background yeah <laughs> paid like 50 bucks it was brilliant so they had like the first week day one you know like in the summer like everyone's looking a little bit you know shoddy right and then the end of the summer it's like i honestly don't know if we if we if we had a lift that day probably did but like we weren't greasing up it was a regular lift it might have been hey five minutes of curls at the end like i promise you nothing more and then you have the return pick, but it's like, of course they look better. You've got a white black background. You've got these unbelievable athletes that have got a slight sweat on. So it's like, yeah, but you know what? Like they loved it. You know, coaches love it. It's like, it's a, it's like a, a medal of honor almost, um, you know, badge of honor. But yeah, there's, there's definitely ways we try. And I think that's part of it. I even had the coach ask me the other day for one. And it's like, we'll get there. We've got one more week of summer. We'll, we'll, we'll get a few. So it's just, I think it's inherently what people think of when they think of us is body change. But we know there's obviously a lot more to it. Like we'll talk about fascia, speed, performance, you know, psychology, relationships, recovery, all that. You know, there's just a lot more to it. Speaking of the body, the the pictures and body images, this is something that I had to deal with. And I don't know if you ever had to and if anybody that's listening to this had to deal with. So when we had a coaching change, the new coach was talking to administrators like, you know, their bodies, you know, the, a lot of these guys, like their bodies don't look good. And so the administrators told me that I was like, did you all tell them that these people that are coming in were walk-ons? I had nothing to do with selecting wow. their bodies and I'm not able to like, yes. I can't train them the way that they are. Like, and that was, that yep. was a point of contention that I know some coaches deal with yep. and it's tough because it's like, okay, why are you only going to point out the negative versus like, look at the positive? Yeah. And I think again, that is funny, you know, they're talking about walk-ons. So they don't, these, this administrator doesn't know who the, the studs are, who the players are actually, the school is, paying for right these guys are paying to be there like there's a different level already um so i think that's just it's kind of sad right i think there's there's levels to it with understanding of the higher level of what we do so like if we had a um a sports supervisor here that was a former strength coach my gosh he, oh, i mean right. before and after picks would be this conversation <laughs> all right dude can you show me some force plate metrics can you show me changes over time can we look at his body weight over time, the fluctuations? Can we look at his IMU data, his catapult data, his connection data? Can we see changes there in his max speed? Have you done timing? Have you done flying tents? Have you done three quarter sprints? Have you done lane agilities? Can we look at those improvements? Because that really is the performance aspect of it, not the aesthetic aspect of it. Um, but again, it's just, I think we're a long way off. And so I think the before and after picks is just an easy one. And you know what? Parents, recruits, they still love it. So like there is still value in it. I absolutely think, and the players love it. I, the first time, the first time in my career, I did pitches halfway through the summer here because I was trying to show some guys, hey, what you're doing is working. Your bodies are changed. So we took one after four weeks, not eight. So I did a f first and four. Some guys, it was three weeks. I did a quick before and after, text it to them. Hey, man, keep going. So like I use it as a motivational tool. Man, I look great. I sent this to so-and-so. Like they think I look great. Yeah, like you want to you want to give reinforcement to their them cutting out some some carbs, right? Cutting out snacks in the week, like not having ice cream on them. You want to give reinforcement to those positive behaviors. So I do think before and after picks, and even then, uh, guys, we've got before and after picks next week. I know they're going to be locked in on their diet more this week. So it's just a, it's, mm. like, it's, it's a sales, right? You want them to be dialed into their process every time. If you say, hey, we've got this next week. Hey, we've got DEXA scan in four weeks, guys. Just keep that in mind. Let's get our best score we've ever had, body fat. Like, I want you to be the best shape you've ever been in your career. It's like, it's no excuse we shouldn't be. Okay, cool, right? You just kind of keep them locked in. So the at least the before and after picks hold them accountable. I just wish that there was probably more direction to the player with the pitchers rather than the coach. That's fair. Uh, you talked about the max velocity 
metric. And that's a question that somebody had sent in to me saying, do you personally, and then do you then, if you don't, why not? Or if you do, why do you recommend doing max velocity sprints that are longer than the court just to train the expression of maximal velocity? Because let's say uh, basketball courts roughly, I think it was like 33 yards, right? So like, okay, if you wanted them to do a fly 10 with a 20 yard build, you don't have enough room for them to slow down on the court. And that was the question, like to train that quality, because as we've learned as strength coaches, improvement in max velocity, like if you can improve max velocity, your um, sub maximal speed is now faster too. So that was the question that this person was asking. Yeah. Great question. Um, I always love doing conversations like this because it's not something I've even think, thought about is doing it longer than the court. We're lucky we have two practice courts together, so I could do it diagonal. So I could now do that if I thought that was something that was, um, I think sometimes we're tied by constraints of what we have facility wise. So it's a really good question. You know, sprinting is the highest central nervous system taxing exercise. Again, higher speed there, higher speed at submax. Um, I do, I do like doing sprints. Actually, I, I like doing it at certain times in the year. I'd say that the body for the summer for me is a big time of body change. Like we've just spoke about. DEXA scans get the body right. When we go into preseason, it's conditioning. And then October time, I'm trying to peak. I've got essentially four weeks to peak before we play a game. That's when I'll really focus on speed. Because the summer can be a grind. Right? I've got really intense practices. I'm not trying to take 20 minutes of my weight session to go on the court, warm them up, max sprint, come in the weight room, and they've got practice later that day. I want to leave that stimulus to practice. And really, if I'm if I'm really efficient with my warm-ups and good at what I do, I could probably get a sprint in at the end of the warm-up anyway. So that's kind of my mindset with it. Um, you know, Adam Petway had some great research. It's like, you know, basketball is really a game of three steps. Even in transition, you can have three big steps before the ref gets in the way, a player comes in the way, you've got to slow down, you've got to change direction. So it's very rare unless it's like you've fallen down, it's a pitch ahead that you're doing a full sprint. Um, but, you know, again, I think you can, as a strength coach, the way I would control that is I, I have full control over warm-ups. I have two courts. I can be really specific on a Monday. I can do this thing in a warm-up especially on a Tuesday, if I don't have weights that day, if I don't lift the guys, I'll take some mini bands down there to get a mini stimulus. Then I'll do the warm up. might do some RSI stuff because of the game the next day. Like that would be where I would do it. I have not thought about doing it longer than that, but I really think it's a great idea as long as the practice load is low. That'd be my recommendation. If they're not practicing, sprint them. Absolutely. It speeds the mother of all qualities. You know, you could say the same for strength, but like speed, it, speed is what gets people paid. Hmm. You know, speed <laughs> is what wins games. Speed is what... You know, so like if you can if you can really improve that and show improvements with flying tens, like that to me is that to me is right where it's at, you know. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Hawken Dynamics. I've had Hawken Dynamics for multiple years dating back to my time at Towson and still utilize them here at Goldfinch when I'm training athletes in Iowa. Hawken Dynamics makes it simple to be able to get input to find out what's going on underneath the hood with your athletes. Whether it's lower body assessment, upper body assessments, you want reliable data to find out how the athlete is putting force into the ground so you can be able to accurately return an athlete from an injury and you can also find out how the athlete is producing force to check how your training is working. Check out Hawken Dynamics in the link down below. Another question, you talk about uh, winning games. Somebody asked, like, what are some, in your opinion, some of the most important key, key performance indicators for the sport of basketball? Does it always have to be weight room specific or is it like, hey, um, you know, contested jump shots made or is it a dumbbell snatch because it's unilateral? Like, what do you think are some really important ones? Man, that's a great question. Um, that's a really, really good question. Uh, I'm going to do a really boring one first and say that player availability is important in any sport. So however you can get to that a healthy roster, and I think that if you peel the onion back, I think that goes into individualized training plans for your guys as best as possible, guys or girls, get to know them as athletes. I do think individualized plans is the way. Yes, it takes way longer for programming. Yes, it takes longer to get from general to specific, but your athletes will appreciate it. You'll get more feedback from them. You'll get better buy-in from them. And really, like you're giving them the best service you can. You know, like you're giving them exactly like if we want, if we call this a professional environment and we want to be seen as professionals, we should provide a professional service. So individual plans for me, especially when I have 11, 12 scholarship guys, I should probably be able to do that. So that's a big KPI is health. Um, I think conditioning, um, I think conditioning is key. I think having a great relationship with your head coach and knowing when to push, knowing when to pull, which kind of marries with health, with practice loads, match day minus two, match day minus one plus one, plus two. I think having a good periodized training plan is good. 
Um, but yeah, conditioning, I think sometimes we think about big S, little C, right? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's on the resume, you know, it's like capital letter, the S, and then the conditioning is like small font. You know? <laughs> so I think, um, I think we could probably increase the font size of the C and we can make that a li little bit more important in what we do. Because I think sometimes the easy way as well is just be like, our oh, practice will take care of it. Well, does it? Do you put heart rate sensors on them? Do you know that? practice is getting them above 90% in certain drills, which is where the games play. Cause we've had heart rate sensors on the guys last year and we know when, when the games play, it's above 90%. So is practice, how long is practice above 90%? If you're, if you look at the iPad and it's in the red for, you know, a good amount of time, cool. Maybe it is taken care of But If it's a two hour, two and a half hour, three hour practice that isn't ever getting in the red, you're not conditioning for the sport. They're not going to be ready for that start of the game where, you know, they've got that, they need that second, second wind of that first time out, everyone's gassed and you're like, Hey, you're okay. You've got your second wind now. We'll be all right. So I think conditioning is a key piece. And that's something I've really tried to look at since I've come here of using, I'm looking at my whiteboard, using certain coaches around campus to try and kind of pick their brain up with conditioning. So like, I want to speak to the rowing coach. I want to speak to the ice hockey coach, strength coach, because ice hockey, like come on real quick. They get after it for two minutes. You're out. Well, that's pretty similar to basketball. Like, what do you do for conditioning? That's a question I want for him. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll send I'll send this to him. So, Joe, if you listen, I'm sending it to you. And then, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, like rowing, like, I mean, you that's the beautiful, like, perfect combination of strength, power, and speed, like, and endurance. Like, the rowing athletes are unbelievable. Their lungs are, I mean, they are, we've got an unbelievable rowing team. I should probably go over there and ask them how they condition and how, here's a question I like, hey, if you were the strength coach for men's basketball, what would you do for conditioning? And they might give you a crazy idea, but it might be the best idea you've ever heard. So that's kind of what, that's the KPI for me. So health, health availability, practice plans, relationship with coach and conditioning. So very, very boring. Um, I do think you need a bulletproof ankles. I think you should take their shoes off, um, do some soft tissue work, the feet every day, work foot compliance, work the soleus more than you currently probably are. Hamstring health, uh, VMOs, lower back and scap retractors are normally the injury sites as well for these guys, scap retractors, because they're always looking down because they're seven foot and you need to, Mm. especially if you're trying to get a rebound you can't really rebound like this you need to open up so scat retractors i think is probably a low-hanging fruit <clears throat> one of the things i wrote down was the relationship with coach because i'm on the special interest group executive board for the sport of football at the nsca and one of the big questions that we're kind of talking about and is like forming the relationship with coaches or like who's the load management person right because like you might have the title or i might have the title but at the end of the day you know that the sport coach is really the one yep. because in your example right there like all right if the coach has a two and a half hour practice if that's also supposed to be the conditioning session stimulus in addition to the technical tactical piece because you're not going to go on the back end and do more conditioning. Like now the guys are deconditioned. So this is my kind of extended roundabout way of trying to get you to how, how do you work that relationship? How do you be able as a strength coach to work in this high performance setting and, and help the athletes and help the coach? Cause we're all on the same team and owners and management. Like you want the players to play player availability. So that way the best players are on the court. So the coach has his best players. You look good. The players look good. The, ownership is happy that the best players are on the court the fans are like all of those things i think you got to have a really good memory <laughs> this sounds kind of crazy you gotta have a really good memory of previous games the team has played like you got to be dialed in with what you've seen in games and know in practice so like well coach you said we were this hypothetical you know tell me when you didn't think we were in shape last year like genuinely ah, uh, the second half against so and so yeah but he fouled out and like we would, we had to bring so and so in. You remember? Oh yeah, but I don't care about that. There's instances like that. I'll just say, like memory, I think is really important of what the team does. So like, be dialed in when you need to be dialed in. I do think this day and age, I think I like to see myself as a hybrid between strength coach and sports scientist. And I got no issue saying that. Literally, just said it right. I love the technology piece. I used Connexon for three years at Firm, and that was a massive piece for us in getting coaches by him because I'm never going to have the coach's eyes he does. I've never played the game, right? He's played the game. He's coached it for way more years than I have. He knows way more about the technical, the tactical. But like, so if I say to him, you know, for example, we, we use it for a year, collected data for a year. And then after that first year, I said, well, we, I think we practiced a little bit too hard the days before some of these games. So I looked at it. I looked at the day before loads, two days before loads, and I put it in an Excel file, took a minute, right? Took a minute. 
Um, I said, coach, I've got some stuff I want to show you. I think it's pretty, really interesting. So memory first, and I'd say like stories and case studies. So stories can tie into this one. It's like this, the story of, hey, coach, like you got a second. I've, I think I've got something that could really help us next year. Your coach is going to go look at his phone and go, yep, when can we meet? Right? I think I've got something that we could do a lot better this year we did last year. When can we meet? First off. And then if you present it in a way, like don't use the automated reports these companies sent. I just don't think they're good enough. I think make it into your own file. Make it something that can be like a five-year-old can read, not that coach the five-year-old, but like make Correct, it super yeah. simple, right? Yeah. Super simple. You don't need to put human acceleration. Just put load, uh, intensity, volume, whatever. And so I let's say, coach, tell me the best games you thought we played last year. Blah, blah, blah. Highlights them in green. Okay, well, let's look at the loads the day before. Let's see if we see a correlation. So first of all, I think you involve the head coach with the process, but you tell him, hey, I'm, I've spent time on this. He'll see it from the Excel file. Damn, what's this? This is every game we played last year in practice loads. Oh, wow. I'm just trying to like get to the answer of, are we out of shape? When can we peak? Did we do too much? Like, this is all very unobjective. Like, this is no one point of fingers. So we did that and we had a huge, you know, we found that we played the team down the road, our local rival, and the day before the game, it's crazy high load every time we play them. But why is that? Because coaches amped up, let's install this, let's run a bit more, like very amped up, right? They, they want to win, they got to win that game. So they increase the practice duration. It's probably not the right thing to do for the legs of the players. So when you show them that, wow, we did too much that day. I think we did. Yeah, coach. So next year, let's try and do this kind of model to high, low, right? Wow. Did a lot better. So then you get the buy-in straight away. And now you can look at going, all right, well, what are the numbers that we found for correlation? He wanted to do the day, Monday and Tuesday together. What's that total load? I was more thinking of the Monday session and the Tuesday session individually, because I'd want to go day at a time. Coach, we go down to practice on Monday. It's what we want to think about. But that was my former coach. All right. So now for my current coach, um, you know, I just sat down with him actually before this and we went through players and I said, coach, I want you to tell me, we're just passing through, tell me what you want to improve on with these players. We've had them for seven weeks now. What do you see on the court that I'm missing? Uh, lateral speed, man, this needs to be in better shape. So I can write that down. Great. And he's now giving me that information. It's my turn to program for it. So I think with this, he has nece he's not necessarily used a lot of technology in the past. He's been very, very successful. So how can I find that balance? And I think, again, we've collected data for the last three, four weeks. I need to make, I need to look at that first with my assistant, with my intern, my computer science intern. I need to look at them and be like, how can we make this? Is there any trends so far? Who's, who's maxing out? Who's underperforming? Present that to him in a way that he finds value in it. And then when we get closer to the season, probably early October, then talk about the conditioning, then talk about the, the pre, the plan itself. But I think you've got to have, you've got to have data is what I would say. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Vitruve VBT. With Vitruve, you can accurately measure what speeds your athletes are moving the bar. No longer do you have to program simply based on sets and reps. You can program for your more mature athletes based on the velocities that they are hitting. You can accurately measure at a great price with Vitruve, and you can have this integrate with your team builder, making it simple so you no longer have to write down the recorded reps from other devices. Everything in one place with Vitruve VBT. Check them out in the link down below. You gotta have a really good memory of the games to be like, coach, I agree with you. I think that's also important to say, coach, I agree with you. I did think we looked sluggish that second half. I do. Rather than just be like, oh no, it's not personal. I want to win. We did look sluggish. That's fine. Um, could we have done more in the morning of the game? Could we give them better snacks? Whatever. Let's figure it out. But what they want is a solution. They don't want problems, they want solutions. So memory, I think case studies and stories is good. Um, learning from NBA teams is always helpful. I would say that whatever, if you're a football player, football strength coach, and you've got NFL stories, you see, hey, coach, I saw that Cardinals did this the other day. What are your thoughts on this? You know, hey, I saw that, um, you know, the Falcons did this. Like, I thought this was kind of cool. Can I, do you mind if I try that in the warm up? Yeah, go ahead. You know, like, I think that kind of stuff's called sending articles. I forgot the original question because I went on a big old tangent. But I think technology and having data, I think, is crucial because it's not just, it's not just my, word it's like it's the fact and that's actually last thing i say is that's what Ray and baloo did from reading Raya's linkedin articles when they went to alabama saban was like this is all from what i read not not knowing these people Saban was like i don't need you to give me more like essentially subjective opinions i need facts well that's what our system does coach we've got speeds we've got 1080s this is our system these are the injury rates this is the reductions this is how we can improve speed this is our whole system strength coach and sports scientist hired at the same time that's the way forward in my opinion <clears throat> and so we were talking about getting coach buy-in and what i wrote down and what i'm hearing was you say that you got you're asking questions and then being like hey let's get a specific definition for okay you know coach said lateral speed okay cool what does that mean to you 
and you're asking not to be um, instigative. You're asking to be like, Hey, I want to know so I can improve it for you. Like I want to just be crystal clear. 100%. And even he just, you know, he said like, uh, you know, I'm reading here, quick turn of his hips, reaction time, decisive movements on defense. I can train that in the weight room. We can do some, we can do some lateral movement. Like, no, and I know exactly what he means. So, yep, coach, I got you. Or like, you know, some of it's quite vague. You know, some of it was like, I need to get in better shape. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll at least work on that, you know, and then maybe I'll check in in a few weeks. Coach, what do you think? Got in better shape? Yeah, I do think he's got, oh, ah, nah. Like some of these, especially knowing the head coach, right? Some of these things are just, it's going to be a quick conversation. Some it's going to be more in depth. Um, but I think there's just trust there as well, right? With the buyer, like trust he's told me, cool. Matt now knows what I want. Cool. I'll make it work. I'll make it happen. You know, and then I can see, and then also we've got about four or five assistants as well. So, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, coach talks about this player's conditioning. Like, what do you see? Yeah, man, we just, we've been talking about a staff meeting. He's just like, we just getting gassed on that third game. Ah, oh, okay, cool. So he needs more time in the red. Perfect. We can do a morning session where we get on the verse kind of time in the red. That's what he needs. That's what coach means. You know, I can get more, God, the, the amount that our head coach is, I mean, it's just crazy. I, I have a different level of respect for it now. Just the, the amount this guy gets texts and calls and it's different. It's different. So like, I want to respect his time as well. And like, he, he's trust me with the information. So just trying to make a plan from it. But I think buying as well, like if last thing I'd say, like in, in the stories that can be the NFL stories, the stories can be the Alabama stories, but like that adds buying as well. If your coach knows you're in here and I have a saying to myself, it's like when I'm at work, I work. And it's really sad and cliche, but like, if I'm here, like, let me just max out. Let me read because I want to read. Let me learn. When I go home, I'm done. Like, I don't have to worry if I had a hard day. Like, but my head coach will know that. My staff will know that. My players will know that. And I feel like that can be, I think it's such a simple thing, but I think that can separate us in this profession because I think it's probably a lot more coaches than we think that go to work and maybe work out for two hours, shower for 30 minutes, whatever, <laughs> like, chat for 30 minutes, three hours of the day, you're there for five hours, practice is two hours, now you've only got three hours. Like, I just feel like, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm better than anyone. That's not my saying. This is just how I'm wired and I feel like it's helped. And I feel like for young coaches, you don't need to be a hard ass, you don't need to be seven to seven. Like I'm locked in, I can't talk to you, no side conversations. Like I'm a pretty fun, energetic guy. Like I'm, I want to shoot the breeze. But like I need to shut the door and lock in at some point in the day, every day, if I'm trying to get better for these guys. I couldn't agree with you more because I've seen it personally too, where people they'll complain about not having enough time and you kind of just watch them go about the day and you're like, bro, there's, there's 30 minutes, there's 30 minutes. There's now you just got an hour and a half to get stuff done. Yep. And a lot, I would also say like, um, I'd say like you learn more to get more or like if you, the more you learn, the more you'll get, you'll get more respect. You'll probably get more coaching FaceTime. You'll get more warm up time. You'll get more lift sessions. Like the more you learn, the more you earn. And then, yeah, you could think about that financially as well. You could think about that titles. You could think about that respect. But like that ties into the more, you know, when I'm at work, I work. If I keep learning, like the guys are going to get better because I'm not learning for me. I went on a three mile run this morning. I was gassed. I'm not learning conditioning protocols for this guy. I'm just trying to stay healthy. Right? I'm not, I'm not doing this for me. But like, if I can learn and do it for them and like, that's the, just the beautiful part of our job, man. You know, it's like they win and you feel like you, you contribute to that a little bit in the shadows. Like, I don't know what it is about strength coaches, but like that just, that just gets me fired up. You know, like I'm good with that. We get, we're going to get players drafted next year. It's going to make me feel really good that we had a pick part in that. And they're good kids. Well, so not to love, you know, like there's no ego to it, but I do think you got to put the time in, you know. Talking about the assistant coach thing, how, how do you recommend our listeners do that like how do they go in and and respect okay hey i'm not trying to because people have said this in the past before where it's like hey okay the head coach is busy as you just said you know mm -hmm. being at michigan basketball like that's a lot of people pulling you in a lot of directions how do you respect that time and then okay let me talk with the assistants let me talk with people who are the you know point portion for the weight room but making sure that you're not um you know going behind the coach's back. I don't know the exact right word yeah, to say, but like seem like you're undermining and like, oh, well you're, well, you're telling this assistant coach more than you're telling me the head coach. And it's like, yeah, I'm trying to filter it out and and not just give you the noise. Like I want to give you the really important things, the signal that really matters. Yeah, uh, my advice would be trying to work on a staff that's got low ego. I'm very blessed with that here. Like that's part of it as well. Like assistant coaches, head coaches, we're just trying to get the players better. My head coach wouldn't mind if I had a 30 minute conversation with the assistant about one of our players, you'd probably love it. And I didn't tell him, he'd probably love it. 
but there's other two two situations I say like a lot of our staff train like we've got a really healthy staff that trains in here so like that could be an opportunity what's up coach hey what's up you know they're working out hey I want to am I right in thinking this like we I've heard you say we don't backpedal much so like if I'm doing conditioning do you think I should take that out or do you think I should do like an open stance like what do you think he can be in between sets, just finish the bench press and go, you know what? Like, that's a really good point. Back, back, coach don't like back. Like, you know, you've got insights there straight away. Perfect. Hey, what do you think? You played, a lot of these coaches at high majors played at high level. So they are subject matter experts themselves. They are future head coaches. So like asking them there, but also like after practice, like after practice, guys are getting shots up. Well, coaches normally just kind of huddle. One coach be sitting with a player. One co- if I really want to talk to him about something, I'll, e- I'll either say, hey, coach, I want to do something in the warm-up. Can you watch it and just give me some feedback after on it? So, like, if I do a lateral shuffle and I talk about the three steps, I'm like, did that make sense to you? He could be like, yeah, but, like, it would almost be easier if they had a ball in their hands. They looked a bit awkward. Okay, great. Like, there's no ego in that conversation. We're just trying to get better. I'm asking him for his advice. So, inherently, when you ask someone for their advice, they have more buy-in in what you're doing. And they'll look at the warm-up more. They'll probably support you more. Because they're like, you know what? Like, Matt didn't quite get it right, but he tried and he asked <laughs> He asked for feedback. Let's give him yeah. some grade. You know, like, you're not going like, to really mess it up, right? But I, I do think like in the weight room, but I also think after practice, like it's just those like corridor conversations. It's just like the soft skill of being like, hey, coach, can I, can I talk to you real quick? Like if it's a head coach after practice or like he works out in here every day. So I get that contact time with him. My previous head coach didn't, but I would probably know, you know, what? at the end of practice is probably not good because the assistants used to huddle and kind of wait for him to be done, and then they go to the office. But I bet if I text him and say, Coach, could we meet on Wednesday at some point? There's something I really want to talk to you about. I think it could really help X player. He's going to meet with me that day because he's going to know. I don't often text him like that. And if it's going to improve that player, he wants to hear about it. Shoot, he'll probably say, let's meet right now. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And then like, he's then like, I'm like, not waiting till Wednesday. I want to know now. <laughs> on my way. On my way. And then he's like, yeah, he's, he's on the laptop. Yep. Come in and you ask him about it. And again, like, I think just humility is big. Like, even if I played this sport, like say I was a strength coach for soccer, like I played soccer, uh, I'll say football. No, I said soccer, football. I played football <laughs> my whole <laughs> life, right? My whole life. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Sleep Me. Sleep Me are the makers of the Chili Pad, which has been my bed cooling device since 2020. Chili Pad will allow you to sleep and not wake up hot anymore. This was something that I had to worry about. I used to have the air conditioning down way too low. Now, I don't have to have the air conditioning as low because my Chili Pad, my Doc Pro, keeps my bed cold at night. Check out Sleep Me, check out the Chili Pad, check out the Doc Pro in the link down below. But like, I've never played at like the top, I played professional, I've never played the top, top level. So I still don't know what they feel. I still don't know what they go through. Certainly the pressures of conditioning. Like I know things that work for me, but like I'm an average athlete. I'm not working with these race cars. So like, you've got to have an awareness of that as well. So like, I think you can use some historical like background of what you've done and like, hey, this worked at this place and I actually saw this, but like trial and error is key, but also like just ask the players, ask the, ask the coaches. I think that's just, I think it's helped me, but I honestly think it's just common sense. Like anybody that's take, li- yeah anybody that's been listening to you talk for the last 40 minutes now they can see that you you're either great at lying about it or you really just have subordinated your ego like it's super impressive to hear and it's something that i can visibly see from you and hear and feel from you and i'm sure our listeners are doing the same first question how did you get to be like that has it not always been that way mm-hmm. and then b for anybody that is unaware of you because you've talked about your past dive into like you know how you got into strength and conditioning your past all of that yeah i'll do i'll do b first it might add context to that so i played i went three years at university in england played football there um wasn't done with college did two years at west florida university in the states here at pensacola d2 got my first masters in exercise science Played professional soccer for a year in Antigua, which was a crazy cool experience. Ten months in the Caribbean, one of the only teams in the in the United States League at that time. So every away game was flight to Miami. Crazy experience. Went home two years. Was a personal trainer. Played semi professional soccer, football. Damn. Becoming Americanized. <laughs> not good. I won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't be sending this to my mom. She'll be like, "It's oh, like you God. have a shock." collar on and you're shocking yourself <laughs> i just i just hear my mom's voice he's becoming americanized um and so i played two years of professional semi-professional football and actually i think this was a big thing for me i was two years as a personal trainer working with like gen pop one-on-one with gen pop in like a local gym and i just felt like i needed to do something more, more of my life and i felt like i wasn't done with america i was like i think the college system is perfect for me 
with 18 to 22 year old like athletes that want to be great like I always wanted to be and I'm fortunate it's been captains on my teams like that's just my personality with the personality test the other day I'm high eye I want I get energy around people I, I know who I am self-awareness I think is key right so I was like, let me get back out to the States. Um, so I got back out to the States, did two years at Alabama Huntsville as a grad assistant. In my summers, I played soccer, football for Chattanooga FC and uh, did an internship at UTC. <laughs> it's bad, isn't it? Um, did an internship at UTC and I got a, that's when I got the Florida job. Uh, so I went down to Florida because I knew Colin Crane, was at Florida for a year with men's basketball and men's tennis. And then I went to Furman for six years, men's basketball, men's golf. And then I've come here, I've been here for two months at Michigan. Um, the humility piece, I feel like without becoming too, we're not getting too deep with it. I feel like it's just like how I was brought up. Like my mom was a, an English teacher. My brother was a teacher. My sister was a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Like I just mm. was around like working class, like regular people. There was no ego in our house. Like our house went perfect, but like there was no boast. I had, I've got a twin brother. So we would compete like crazy. We would play football down the park. We would do, well, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was I was always one of the fittest in my team. Well, I had a twin brother to run hill sprints with and to run to preseason conditioning with and run back from like crazy. It was 45 minute run to the conditioning <laughs> session and run back. Like, what were we doing? We're like 17, like you couldn't, couldn't phase us. Um, so I think that, but then I don't know. I, it's how you, how you've been treated is I think how you want to treat others. Right. Mm. So if you've been treated with high ego and you've been treated with no one giving you autonomy, no one giving you ownership, someone micromanaging mm. you, someone mm. not giving you any feedback, but just kind of being a bit of a dick. You're going to be like, I'm good on that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm good on that. And I think once you, when you're an intern or assistant, you never probably think you're going to get to the level where you're ahead and you're managing people, right? Because you're just like, I just want to be here. I just want to train. I get a free protein shake. I don't care that I'm not getting paid. Like, there's that natural progress in this career, right? And then you become assistant. You make 30, 40, 50 grand. You're like, I'm making money now. And then you're like, hmm. And then, then it's not enough because you then are married and you got to provide. But I think once you then get to like, let's say 70, 80, 90 and all that, all that stuff, you now have someone maybe working. If you have an intern, hey, can I intern for you? Oh, okay. Well, you don't want to treat them how you've been treated if it was a bad experience. And I think you just, the way I'd say this, like, have you seen the, the movie Slumdog Millionaire? Yes. Okay. I think that's the perfect, like, like uh, my philosophy is like every question the guy got asked, he had a life experience for the answer, essentially. Mm. So I want to take the, which is really philosophical. I want to take the good that happened to me as a coach and as a person and the bad, and I want to mesh it to be like, no, I'm trying to give my assistants and interns the best experience they could ever have here while knowing it's a tough profession. Yeah, we've got long hours, but like, if we're not doing anything, please read. Don't be on your phone in front of me. That's what I say. The more you learn, the more you earn, right? When we're at work, we work. That's the one thing I say. Yeah, we've got to do cleaning. I'll do it with you. But like, I think that humility piece just comes from like knowing how I was treated and I'm not saying like anyone was like totally bad. So on my resume, like don't, no one needs to freak out. But like, you just see it as well. You see how coaches treat people like Ted Lasso's unbelievable series for so many reasons. So many reasons. All right. The first episode was unbelievable. He remembered the kit man's name. Right. He remembered the guy's name. And he was like, he just called me my name. And it's like, you know how profound that is? Like that's such an unbelievable leadership lesson, but how many coaches in America you think high major strength coaches that like really care about their or really care about the janitor, like just be a normal dude. That's all I'd say. Um, and then last thing, I think some of the stuff I read breeds into that. I think I read, I read a little bit. I like reading Cal Newport, um, Adam Grant and uh, who else is up there? Um, Michael Easter. They're my three guys that I feel like just beautiful nonfiction. Like that hits me hits me run. So, and as you are, you know, as a Christian, it's like, Hey man, like we, we have the ultimate role model, right? Like I'd be a bit of a farce if I'm reading the Bible in the morning and then just treat my interns. Like that's just not who I want to be. That's just not what I read. That's not who I see. That's not who I'm attracted to as people. That's not the person I want to be. Like I want to be someone that works really hard, is really successful, does it the right way, but like just treat people right. That's the one thing we can do is treat people right. <clears throat> Building off that part as Christians, like one thing that I'm trying to figure out is okay, I'm reading the Bible every day and there's different books within the Bible. And, and I feel like I've gotten to the point where maybe these leadership books, I'm like, I don't need to read those anymore. Like if I just apply the principles yeah. from the Bible, like I don't want to waste my time reading those books. But then I'm like, no, like I, I actually opened up one of the, one of my favorite books that I had read again, had read um, before I had dove deep into the Bible. And I was like, okay, there's really good information here. So like, mm -hmm. I guess the question I'm trying to say is like, how do you, 
how do you balance that with like, okay, I know like the principles that are talked in all those leadership books, they point right back to scripture and to Christ. So it's like, yeah. how do you handle that? Yeah. Well, you know, this as a Christian, as a man, it's like some mornings it's really hard for me to sit down and read my devotional. Cause I got this, 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 I got a five month old baby. It's like my reading in the last seven months has been, but there's some moments where I'm like, I really get to sit down and be immersed in the word. So that helps me. But there's also like sometimes I'm like, this is this, this devotional. Like I'm not getting what the Bible's trying to tell me. Like just, there's a moment it's like not just quite getting it. So then I would read the leadership book and I'm like, Ooh, I like that hits really good. It's like when, when I put down a book, right? Nonfiction book and you open it up the next day and I, I pull down the page on the top, right? If I like it. So I know that I've got all these pages like, Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Powerlift. Powerlift is located here in Iowa in the United States of America. I've utilized them back in 2011 when I had them at Harvard. I also had them at the University of Maryland. And then finally when I was at the University of Iowa. Their equipment is strong. It is durable. It is dependable. It's also customizable based upon whatever your needs are at your school. Check out Powerlift at the link down below. And I, oftentimes I'll pick it up and the, I'll read that page and I'll turn it down straight away. I'm like, was that really a good page I left? Or, <laughs> right? Or was it just that I'm like, I'm in a really good mind space now to like and be ready to like receive this? Because I'm like, every, really? I left it every, I got to, every time. It's like, it's an absolute gym. I'm like, I didn't I just underline. I'm like, whoa, okay. I must have got tired towards the end because I didn't underline those three. But I think, I think that's the thing. So like there's times where I'll be really immersed in like a Cal Newport book, like slow productivity recently, like really immersed in that, try and read that. But there's also like, that to me is more like the afternoon, evening, maybe uh, after I've read my devotion in the morning, but like, I don't know, I think a bit, it makes sense, right? If you just keep getting hammered with the same word every day, um, you know, maybe it falls on deaf ears as Christian. Maybe I need a different stimulus. Maybe I need mm. to go audio book in the morning and hear, we ever need to, I listen to worship music. So when I drive in, it's always worship music or podcasts in my car. I don't listen to regular radio. That's just, again, the, the information, I'm the, the diet yeah. of information I'm having, like I think Rich Roll spoke about that, the diet of information I'm having, I'm trying to be really specific. Um, but, you know, changing, it. I was even reading my devotion the other day. I was like, maybe I need a new one for next year because I might've had it for like a year and a half, two years. I just need a different stimulus. I know it's still going to be the same word, still talk about the same guy and the same God. Mm. But maybe I just need a different author. Maybe I just need a different, because my brain's just autopilot. All right, it's going to be a bit of scripture, this. Maybe I need to go back to the old one, which was three pages. You know, I think we just got to have self-awareness with that. Like, I just need, like, as what I do with my athletes, right? I need a bit of variability. I need to train them a little bit different. I need to do a different warm-up because I honestly get a little bit bored sometimes of stuff. So maybe it's just that. Maybe it's a different medium of, of um, information. Favorite... Um favorite worship music that you like i i have a, my i got my christian rap playlist and lecrae is all in it you know uh 116 like andy minia like so i can and like my wife is like how do you listen to the same stuff all the time like first of all it's not the same music all the exact time but like yeah. same thing like i want my fun like i don't i don't really have i don't want to put that kind of space yeah. like eh, that's yeah. what i'm gonna listen to yeah yeah hill songs oh okay hill songs just pretty generic um that's she's kind of cute. I've, I've started singing it to my daughter when she's tired. So it's kind of like just having that in my head is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, Hill songs. And even, you know, when we listen to rap music in here, like I've tried to make it like, I, I need it censored. Like we don't need to be explicit in here. So we just, I, I handle the music. Like let's put it all on. We don't need to hear that. We know what they're talking about. It's not necessarily a clean song, but like, I don't need to hear it. Like, that's not what we want. So, and I guess my encouragement would be like, I was kind of bold in that. It's like, this is what we're doing. Like, if you want to listen to it, you've got headphones, but like, we're not, we could have anyone walk in here. This is a place of like professional, the dumbbells are going to have the block M up. Plates are going to be put back, right? Like this is our office, you know, like, well, let's, let's have a bit of like respect for it, you know, and the people working in it. So clean music, please. Um, yeah. Hill songs. Easy. <clears throat> Getting back to the fascia stuff. I wrote down, have you used the ohm? The th Cause you talked about Prajesh, right? And, and so he, he pointed me to the ohm and uh, we never got one at Towson, but we got the team Cairo was contracted out and he and I were really good friends and I talked to him about it and he bought it for his practice. Mm. Is that something that you've ever utilized? Cause it actually is pretty fantastic. Um, yeah, I was on a call with them uh, probably three weeks ago um, asking about it. Cause we've got a decent budget here for stuff each year, which is nice. And we're also hopefully going to get a renovation next year. So I'm trying to think about what products we want in here. Myself and Jamie, the women's basketball strength coach. I don't have one. I might loan one for a little bit. I love the concept of it. Um, I think it's right on my street to put, to answer that. I think it's a great product. I think the price point's very fair as well. Um, I don't think it's too expensive. I think it's obviously a specific piece of kit. 
Um, but the way Bridges uses it, I think he had a couple of Simply Faster articles on it as well. And like hearing your endorsement of it, the two guys I got on a call was super smart, made complete sense to me. No faff, no fluff, like great product. I will be getting one at some point, I've no doubt. Yeah, like he, I, I messed around with it uh, with Mark and because uh, I heard about it at a CVAS from from uh, Coach B. And yeah, man, it, it seems like a really good device. Yeah, I just like, I don't know, like you can get in those extreme ranges of motion. Yes. With the speed. And you can slow it down and like you have to, bro. Yep. Like yep. it was wild. Yeah, I'm excited because I, I see, you see the video, like the guy pulling it and he gives it to grandma and grandma pulls you like, what? That make any sense but it's the speed right it's not the force necessarily it's the sport it was speed it's moving you could put as much force in it as least force in it as you want is my is my thought at least um but yeah i, I think about like you know cory cory did some great stuff uh schlesinger with with texas like with the foot angles and like a walking sideways with the cable and like just working that foot pattern i think you can do the same thing with the arm agreed um i want to respect your time is there anything else that you were like hey we you know we didn't talk about during our conversation that uh you're like you know what i really wanted our listeners to listen or any listeners to know because i mean we got coaches in high school college pro tactical private all the different sports like what's kind of a big takeaway message that you wanted everybody to um remember um yeah great question i would say um you know i just the main takeaway message just like just be a normal human being in an industry that's like full of ego and full of you're at a conference and everyone's looking at what the emblem is on your chest, not like if you're a decent person or not. So just be a normal dude or woman, but try and do extraordinary work. That's all I'd say. Be ordinary, but try and be extraordinary at the same time. And I think that will hold you in good standing with your current coaches, with other coaches. I think it's a hard balance these days with how much you show of yourself on social media. It's like a FOMO, right? How much do I need to put out there about myself? I think there's just be authentic with that. You don't need to necessarily copy someone else. Just be authentic, be your own you. You'll find your own way, especially if you're a Christian, like you have that belief, like you have faith that, that God is going to do what you want anyway, right? Your plans you hopefully match up with his. If not, like just be a good, just be a good person. And I think you'll be rewarded. I think your athletes will respect you. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm not perfect. By no means am I perfect, but I just try and, we, if you listen to what the coaches tell the athletes every day in a breakdown huddle, and if you listen to what you tell your athletes every day in a breakdown huddle, you should become a better coach because all they're asking for is a little bit more improvement the next day. That's the sim that's the simplest way I think about it. If I listen to what they say about the guys and being coachable and accountable, man, if, if we actually all listen to that as coaches in the huddle, like, man, we'd be phenomenal leaders. That's my aim. It's a mic drop moment. Um, thank you for coming on. We've had uh, Zach Higginbotham has done presentations inside of Strength Coach Network, has been on the podcast a lot of times. He's at Michigan with the football team. You're obviously there. So us over here at Strength Coach Network, we're going to be rooting for you. So thank you for your time today, Matt. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Appreciate you, mate. Thank you. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.